by the way, boys, black. Look at this. I'm huh. down. I'm, I'm oh. up a button. Oh, up a button. Yes, This is please. why the all in pod is falling apart is we got one bestie who thinks he's fucking Hemingway. We got another one who thinks he's Italian nobility. We got another one who all he wants to do is geek out about science and discuss nothing topical. I mean, you guys are a total mess. And, and you're a total mess. Boat. And you? <laughs> and you? <laughs> the fuck are you? cold open. I'm <laughs> present. God. I've been present. Present. Been present. I've been waiting for two weeks. Social. And we got I've been the guy who wants to be the next Tucker Carlson. Oh, really? Yeah, what's, what's wrong did Henry Belcaster write that opening for you? No, what's yeah. wrong with that? Did your writing team write that soliloquy? I'm coming in hot. I've been waiting two weeks to go off. Three, two. Let your winner slide. Rain Man David Sack. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the All In Podcast. We took two weeks off for vacation uh, with us today. Vacation. From Cation. Uh, Sax is off his boat and ready to go uh, after the tremendous boat episode. Friedberg, who. David, didn't why are come you working Italy? from an IRS office? <laughs> what? <laughs> David oh, Sachs is in an IRS David office. David Sachs yes. has joined a call center. Which call center are you working for? <laughs> This is, a this nice is David Sachs wall. from the call in app. Can I set up your Sachs, podcast you, for you, please? You better fucking get here by tonight. Okay. Yeah, Sachs, you better you play coming? fucking cards, bestie. This is bullshit. Bestie, you better fucking show up. This lineup Mr. is a shit Mr. show. Mr. Beast is showing up. Mr. Oh, Beast yes. is going to play cards and he plays eight queen eight offsuit to crack Phil. It's going to be very entertaining. All right. I'm, I'm flying back this afternoon. It's Mr. So. Beast, Allen, Shipple, Muth. This is going to be fucking fireworks tonight. Okay, Fire yeah, fireworks. All right, all right, I am coming, going to lock it up the eight seat. Your eight seat's locked up. Wait, what time does it start? Asshole. 7 to it's 7 a.m. No, it's going to no. be is your, is, your, uh, is your guest house taken? No, you can stay in the guest house if you want. Great. Here we go. No, we can start. Are we David, starting the show? David, we start at is six. Is this the David, show? Yes, David, we start at six, but I, I, we're going to break for dinner as normal at seven. So get here by fucking I'll, six. I'll come. I got to have dinner with my kids. I haven't seen them in a month. So. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just so you do you remember their names. It's boop, boop, and boop. And there's three of them. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's three. I'll come, I'll come after dinner. Okay. All right. All right okay, perfect. good. Good, all right, you're here locked. we go. Uh, first topic of the day is... No, you didn't uh, do the intros, asshole. Go to, all right, go to three, the rest of the intro. <laughs> no, all no, right. no, you already did that part. Just introduce right. the... You started with Saxon. You didn't say when, myself. When did you Friedberg, become the so director? Please. Okay, sit down, Scorsese. All right, with <laughs> us again, the dictator himself, Chamath Palihapitiya. Back from fresh, his Italian castle. Fresh off his Italian castle retreat. Uh, one button up. Maybe we should call you the Duke instead of the dictator. Yeah. Because you've well, really I mean, taken this, this Italian nobility thing to heart. You know, Maybe Jason, Duce, Jason, invaded, Jason invaded my, my castle. <laughs> he ravaged my toilets several of them. <laughs> <laughs> he literally had, he co-opted the butler. He co-opted the chef. And when he would bicycle back into the- I was living Tremont's the, best life. I'll be totally honest for a he week. Would bicycle, he would bicycle back to the, to the house. The gate would close. And they would scurry out with two little cokes, a huge glass filled with ice. I was so confused when two I got coke back. Zeros. I was like, "What's going on?" He's like, "Uh, Mr. Jason, Mr. Jason, <laughs> Mr. Jason." What, he always what percent. What percent of your book did you write, J. Cal? Um, well, a nonfiction book typically sixty thousand is the target. So I'm going to write sixty and then try to edit it down to fifty. And I got the first ten done. Can uh, I, sorry, can I just say on the on the plane? As well as at my house, Jason read us the intro. I'm not going to say what they're about or the title of the book. The first couple chapters, it's fucking amazing. Oh, but wow. The idea, What's no, the no, book no, about? I legit. The idea is amazing. The title is fantastic, and what he's written so far is exceptional. I was genuinely like, Aww. it's great. It's really, really great. Well, a lot of it was informed by the discussions we've been having here. Uh, of course, back in the mix is Friedberg, the Queen of Quinoa. Uh, in front of some Kmart artwork uh, that he purchased for his new house. Uh, how are you doing, <laughs> Queen? Uh, how, how are you feeling about your decision to not come to Italy with us? Yeah, Queen. I don't want to talk about it. Hey, can we uh, can we tell our best Italy story? Oh my God, I don't know what the best, <laughs> there's a lot of best Italy stories. Well, I want to tell two stories and one of them is the joke I didn't make at the speech, which I thought was the best fucking joke and I want to just get your reaction. So I'm just going to tell. Okay, All right. So, so just to give a little so background here. Our friend's 50th birthday. Two of our friends had 50th birthdays. <laughs> me and our other friend. 
And so we were in uh, Italy for a week as a group, playing cards and celebrating those two birthdays. The joke I didn't make was the following joke, which is, all right, guys, I just want to call And this is for out. friend number one, redacted. Yeah, redacted, yeah. Uh, I just want to call out the elephant in the room. You know, there's really someone very, very famous amongst us. Um, Uh-oh. You know, he's known uh, to be one of the richest men in the world. He's known, um, you know, to really uh, love rockets. He throws, you know, up rockets all the time. Um, <laughs> the despotic leader of North Korea is here, Kim Jong-un, everybody. And I point to DC. Oh my God. <laughs> that was the joke. That is so annoying. Wow. That was the joke I didn't oh, get to make. Wow. You can't tell because, that joke. Because, because it would, it would, in context of, you know, obviously it would have been a very, yeah. Uh, all right. And, uh, yeah, it was just a great trip. I have to say, uh, I took well, my, the two my, weeks. Yeah. My Italy story is that so the second birthday is J Cal. The first mm -hmm. birthday is a friend to remain nameless. Redacted. The second birthday redacted. The second birthday was J Cal's 50th. Then we find out that J Cal's birthday was actually like six months ago, six months ago, November, November 28th. Yeah. Nobody, yeah. nobody cared. And frankly, none of us <laughs> went to Italy for J Cal's birthday. We, we went, went for the months other ago. <laughs> we went for the other guys. We went to the other guy's party. <laughs> yeah. J Cal's birthday is like COVID. He keeps trying to bring it back in different variants and no one wants any part of it. <laughs> <laughs> so on the last night, oh, the last night God. of the trip, we had the J Cal birthday party and what do they serve? Pizza. pizza. I mean, like, because it's on J. Cal's dime. I mean, the rest of the week we had this like magnificent yeah, well, five-star. God forbid you throw my birthday party for me, Snacks. You didn't even throw in any breadsticks. I mean, he was like, he just door dashed <laughs> Domino's. We had truffle pizza. Unlimited say, truffles. It was delicious. I think it was the best meal. I think you're just a little jealous because the dinner you hosted maybe didn't hit the notes you wanted to hit, Sax. Oh my God! Are you serious? We brought in. I mean, Cirque he flew Soleil. in a fucking troop from <laughs> Las Vegas. He flew in a circus I was talking about troop. The food. I was talking about the pizza versus. You the, know. By the way, I just want to say steak. that that whole circus thing in the in the water. Uh, I got so mad at one of my kids because it was so dark and the kids were in the pool yeah. and he kept diving yes. into yeah. the water. And yeah. I kept saying, stop, I can't see you. Yeah, I I can't. And so I was just like, he never, none of the kids should have been in the pool. Anymore. I agree with that. And, and the truth of the matter is, you know, my five years old, Old was in the pool too, and all I could do was keep an eye on keep him. Keep an eye on him. I was him. so worried about it. I was playing lifeguard with my three I as well. I didn't enjoy the show for that reason. Yeah, me but too. They had the time of their lives. Yes, they loved it. And actually, so, that was that was definitely worth it. I and mean, the day before, I want to give credit to Sax because Sax and I went down to that restaurant and we made them open up the wine closet. We raided it. We found <laughs> the best three bottles of wine and we brought them back for everybody. Oh, and nice. then and then I'm not sure if you remember this. We taped an episode of Call In. In which uh, I was a little drunk. Yeah, I was drunk. I was completely. Drunk. Yeah. So anyway, the whole world can listen to us drunk on call in. In uh, we're launching on September second. So oh, wow. be, yeah, nice. Congrats. Yeah, yep. it's going to be a big deal. And uh, congratulations to the all in syndicate members who wet their beaks, and to my syndicate members. Uh, people don't know this, but it was the absolute record we've ever had for any syndicate. I believe at the end of the day, we had 150 slots and we had 950 people apply sacks. Amazing. We had a million or so in allocation. And I think we had 7 million in demand. I am really excited. I'm really excited. I think Colin's going to be product. huge. Yes, oh. I'm really excited about this product. It's the best it's product be I've huge. been involved in creating. It's better than Yammer. It's better than PayPal. Truly. Oh, <laughs> oh, spicy take. Yeah. Wow. I yeah, it's, I'm, it's I'm really, really glad good. daddy daddy I'm got a really little good. tasty poop. Sax, don't hurt your um don't hurt your elbow patting yourself on the back there, but go ahead, continue. <laughs> That's <laughs> all. A little, you got a little don't, product manager elbow there? Patting don't yourself dislocate on the back? your tricep. The feedback we've gotten from users has been incredible. I mean, it's just the reactions I'll really I'll tell strong. you what's good about it. Here's here's what I think you nailed. Um, as a person who's been in podcasting for over a decade, um, the critical um, aspect of this is when you pop up your club or room on call in, it creates a podcast out of it with an RSS feed. Um, and you can go listen to the previous show. So if you are listening to this, and you wanted to create your own version of all in, you could do it on call in just get three of your knucklehead friends and talk about your adventures on boats and private jets and drinking fine wine wherever you are and you can start your own podcast yeah it's not really expensive about the wine room. not included right it's not the key insight it's not about the room it's about the show 
Mm. You know, like everything we think of as social audio is really just a feature of creating a show, creating a new mm. podcast. And uh, so anyway, people really like it. I'm very excited. September How many 2nd shows is the have been created in the beta? This is the thing that's blown me away is like well over a hundred. I think maybe oh, wow. a couple of hundred. If you go to the show directory, you just, and, and the cover art that people have created is really elaborate. You know, people nice. are really getting into it. I've I don't said know this why before. somebody's I think you're never a made it. Yeah. You're a phenomenal uh, product builder. So I think this is really exciting. Thank yeah, you. Under, underrated product builder, I would say. But no, it's just interesting that this doesn't exist. Somebody should have made this already. Like there's Zencaster and Riverside for recording podcasts. There's Libsyn for hosting them. What uh, What's happened as a, as a protected minority? I'd like to ask this question. What happens? What's happening? to clubhouse um i think it's irrelevant i'll be i don't i, mean, I don't want to dunk on founders but um i think that they uh no, but why can't they just do these features it sounds i, I mean, mean i'm not, I'm not, I'm not I, trying I to take anything away they from will you, David, copy but these Sachs's are features for sure i think yeah. they will copy it at some point yeah but but i think that it's, so it's, a good, it's a good question and i really think there's different visions here so, I mean, I've listened to their founder talk about his vision, and it's very much about creating this live serendipitous type experience, like kind of like a cocktail party. And that's fine. We're not doing that. We're creating long tail podcasting is what we're doing. And my experience is informed by what we've all been doing on the show for the last year and a half, which is podcasting, right? And the thing that I've seen that I didn't know until we did the All In Pod is how much work goes into what JCal does behind the scenes. It's incredible. You know, we got Nick doing six hours of post-production on the show, I want to automate all that work away so anybody can do what we do. And that's like a very different vision. No offense, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, not everybody is going to want to put the type of post-production into this. They don't have, you know, I've got six people on our podcast team. Like it's not everybody's got that infrastructure. So over time, you'll build that. I believe it. Um, and yeah. I think it will turn out great. All right, let's get to our first um, topic here. Uh, while we were away, the United States started the process of leaving Afghanistan after a 20 year war, uh, in which I think it's pretty safe to say that was an unwinnable war. And uh, we uh, have failed like the Russians did. Sachs had a uh, tweet uh, that was a uh, well, getting a little bit of play on the old Twitter. What we're seeing before our eyes is the collapse of the American empire because the people in charge are completely corrupt and incompetent. But we can't talk about that because insiders can never criticize other insiders. The Larry Summers rule. Did I tweet that? You did. No. Oh, um, right. Yeah, I mean, so <laughs> you, you might have had a couple of drinks. Um, and then. Sorry, you, he actually didn't. He just texted that in the group. Okay, so that was a confidential text to our thought, to our <laughs> group that we're not supposed to even say exists. Well, no, it's okay. Don't beep it. It's okay. I mean, it's 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 true. It's it's not exactly what I tweeted, but it's similar to things I've mm -hmm. been tweeting. And tragically, uh, yesterday, um, ISIS K, which is an Afghan affiliate of the Islamic State, claimed responsibility for uh, two suicide bombings outside of the airport, and that tragically killed uh, over a hundred people. Uh, 90 Afghan citizens and 13 American service members. Uh, I guess, you know, we're not here to talk about um, wars. It's not exactly in the mandate, but everybody wants our opinion on this. So let's get started. Sachs, you have strong opinions. We'll start with Well, you. it's yeah, I mean, how can you not talk about this? This feels to me, this is one of those events where, you know, I was glued to my TV for days. I think I was in France at the time the Taliban overrun, overran Kabul. And yeah, it was, you know, the, the Afghanistan war has been going on for 20 years. No one's been talking about it. It's just this thing that's been happening in the background. But all along, we've been assured by the Pentagon that we're winning. Hey, you know, don't worry about this. We got this. And then you wake up one day and all of a sudden we've lost the war and the Taliban's overrunning the country. And you're like, what is going on here? You know, not only is the the botched withdrawal incompetent the fact that we were lied to for two decades about what was really happening um the the idea that we had created you know we were how many times were we told that we had created this afghan army it was 300 uh, strong we spent you know two trillion dollars in the country uh you know being and we were told the whole time that we were building institutions there uh that you know that we were creating a democracy in the middle east that uh, we were even you know um promoting gender equality and uh, lecturing the Taliban on toxic masculinity or something like that. And then we find out one day that poof, the whole thing was just kind of a lie. It was this giant debacle. And now we can't even get our, uh, we can't even get our civilians out of the country. 
Not only that, but we we've seen 12 people, 12 American servicemen and women killed yesterday, 13. trying to 13, trying to protect the airport. Uh, almost a hundred um, Afghans. Uh, now we'd only have to not only contend with the Taliban, whose positions I don't think any of us know about, but we also have to deal with ISIS K, which is like some, you know, offshoot affiliate of ISIS run by a guy who was actually summarily killed by the Taliban, but that didn't clearly stop anybody. The, the level of, honestly, just to say the, the, the lying that we've been doing on this topic is just utterly, um, it's really, really scary. You know, how could we have gone 20 years, $2 trillion, 2,400 American lives and counting, and found a way to just basically waste all this money and tell ourselves these lies for so long, and it turns out none of it was true. Um, and then the back half of it is that we look like a little bit of a country that's sort of in decline because we can't even figure out an orderly withdrawal. It's not as if, you know, this thing came out of the blue out of nowhere. This was a negotiated withdrawal. So we had months to plan for this, you know, and we had months to do the right honorable moral thing for all of these, for, for all of these people that helped us in that country. Just to give you a, a, a small anecdote. You know, the day that Kabul was overrun, you know, the Democrats were actually tweeting out about uh, celebrating Librarian Day. That's what they were focused on. Jason and I on the way back, you know, I, we flew back with my with my mom and my sister, we, we stopped in Toronto to drop them off. And the planes beside us, Jason, do you remember this? Yeah, two uh, big planes, I think Brett, cargo planes. I think Brett or Paul were telling us, or pi my pilots were telling us, these planes uh, have been going back and forth saving refugees in Afghanistan. And it's like, wow, what an honor to just be beside these, these amazingly heroic men and women. And, you know, I don't know, Jason, if you saw, but as we were refueling, they came and boarded and they were getting ready to leave again. Wow. And meanwhile, that America cannot get even to a point of view on the topic. And I think that's what's so shameful. It's like, not only did we spend the money, not only did we lose all these lives, not only didn't we have an orderly withdrawal, we couldn't even at the end guarantee the safety of Americans or do the right thing for all these people who risk their lives to help us fight clearly a useless war. Freeberg, you have thoughts watching all this? I know you don't like when we delve into politics too much, but what are you, yeah, you have any thoughts you want to add? Yeah. I don't know if it's about politics as much as um, I kind of use a little bit of a startup analogy. Like America never really found product market fit <laughs> with what we were trying to do in Afghanistan, th there's some fantastic um, Gallup polling that's been done in Afghanistan uh, over the past uh, 15, 20 years already. And they've actually had people on the ground polling there. And most recently, which has been consistent for over 10 years, polling shown that 87 to 90% of Afghans um, said that the government is corrupt. This is the government, you know, put in power put in place by the United States, 90% say businesses are corrupt. And if you go back to a poll they ran in 2010, the question was, in general, which of these statements comes closest to your point of view? Sharia law must be the only source of legislation. 56% of the Afghan population in 2010 believed that to be true. And another 38% said Sharia law must be a source of legislation, but not the only source. That leaves just 7% of people that think that Sharia law should not be... Is it Sharia um, or Sharia? Sharia, sorry. Sharia law Sharia. should not be yeah. part of the um, legislative process uh, in defining the Afghan laws and constitution. And so, um, you know, it's really telling that, you know, it's almost like when you, when you start a company and you try and create a product and you sell it to a customer base, you got to figure out what the product is. You got to make sure the customers want it. And then the, 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 the idea for the startup works. The problem here is our views as, as a nation and maybe Western democracy doesn't necessarily fit with what that market wants. And we can certainly make the case that we believe that our ethics and our values are superior and provide more of an opportunity for individual freedom and liberty, things that we believe should be available around the world. But if the market's not buying it, the customers don't want it, you're really just raising a ton of venture money, trying to create a product that no one really wants. And at the end of the day, you're, you're trillion dollars down and you have to shut the thing down and it goes bankrupt. 
And that's effectively what, what went, went down here. And if you look at the history of Afghanistan, remember, they were in the Soviet-Afghan war in the 80s, nearly the entire decade of the 80s. Then the Tal- Taliban came along and provided a degree of stability in the 90s. And then all of a sudden, this Al-Qaeda 9-11 war began, um, you know, after Taliban had been in power for a year. And it's been 20 plus years of strife and cha- or 20 years of strife and challenge where the population have increasingly viewed the government to be corrupt, businesses to be corrupt. And here's a really interesting statistic, um, which also came out of this uh, polling that Gallup does. Over the last 10 years, the percentage of Afghans that are happy with their present household income has gone, or are not happy, sorry, with their present household income has gone from 60% to 90%. Nine out of 10 Afghans as of last year were not making enough money to make ends meet. So you put all of these facts together, you've got this long history of strife with this, you know, company effectively coming in trying to tell you how to run your government, how to run your, your country that doesn't match with your beliefs on, on, on your, your, the way you think a government should be built. You've got all of this turmoil that's happened historically. You know, it really was, um, I would say to some degree, this inevitable failure of a startup that got overfunded, that never found product market fit, that never really got off the ground. Certainly the exit strategy on how do you wind something down in this case, and it certainly relates to human lives and the tragedy of the partners that we had on the ground um, was was totally mishandled. But the broader picture here is like... we. we I think know. it's more corrupt than that. I think that we basically engaged in a $2 trillion wealth transfer from the people of the United States, the citizens of the United States, to the military industrial complex. That's what we did. Well, I mean, I have... Two points I want to I want to build on from from yours Freeberg and now yours Jamath, which is the original mandate here was to go in get rid of Al Qaeda and to also you know kill Osama bin Laden and to not have uh, the Taliban giving safe harbor to Al Qaeda. That quick that mission got accomplished in large part in the first year or two, and then uh, when we finally got to Osama bin Laden in Pakistan, I think. It, it probably would have been a better idea to understand this is an unwinnable war, get in there, destroy the Taliban, leave, and then say, if you come back, we'll do it again. But we're not going to stay here for 20 years, to your point, Freeberg, and try to create a revolution if the people are not ready for it. I think that we have to start looking at our foreign policy and saying we do need we do have a better view of human rights clearly than the Middle East, uh, and certainly Afghanistan. And we do want to promote human rights around the world and freedom. But we're not this doing is, that. We're well, not we're not that, we're not freedom fighters of democracy or justice. We, we should are be. led we should be. We are led by motives of revenue and profit. I know that, but we <laughs> should be. And when we went and we kicked the Nazis' asses uh, and we beat Japan when you know they were trying to dominate the world, we were doing it to stop communism. And I think when you look at nation building and these these kind of revolutions, to Friedberg's point, they, they have to want it as well. So we should be working with the countries that are teetering on going from authoritarianism to democracy. I and we should take the high ground and we should be the more authority no, no, no. of the world. Because if we're not, that. who's going to be? I, th- I, th- I agree with that part. But I think the right thing to do is just to open our doors and say, you know what, we're here. There's a draft, right? And the smart and the capable and the willing, we're willing to basically bring uh, inside of our borders so that they can work on our behalf. And that's what other countries, I think, get right about all of this stuff. Like, uh, again, as a Canadian, um, you know, the Canadian perspective of this is not that you deploy troops and you get embroiled in these, you know, debacles over 20 years and thousands of lives and trillions of dollars. It's the exact opposite. They're there to support humanitarian efforts, right? They're there to send peacekeeping forces as they need to. But otherwise, their real response is to actually then open the borders for folks that want to be there who are then wanting to trade up, Jason, to those values because that's the simple way to self-select. Instead of saying, I'm going to impose my version of democracy over there, I'm actually going to show you what our version looks like over here. And if you want to come, the doors are open. Certainly being an example is step one. And we, I think, do that largely well. But we do need to sometimes intervene. And I think that's the question here is, when is it just to intervene when there is human rights on the line and a country is teetering on authoritarianism or democracy. Like, where is that line? The just cause here was to go get Osama bin Laden because he attacked us. And we should have gotten out of that country as soon as we realized that bin Laden was no longer there. I mean, that was basically after the Battle of Tora Bora. And if we didn't leave then, we certainly should have left after we got bin Laden in around 2010. So what were we still doing there? We were engaged in this exercise of nation building, which, by the way, we spent $6 trillion on nation building 
building exercises in the Middle East between Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, for what? For naught. This is why the electorate is in such a foul mood. How many of our domestic disputes are caused by the fact that we squandered that $6 trillion? That's more than uh, Biden's entire domestic agenda. Um, you know, so we wasted all this money. To Freeberg's point, we never understood the culture there. And to Chamas' point, it was a giant money funneling operation to defense contractors. Um, there was a, a great piece of reporting by an independent journalist named Michael Tracy, and he talked to frontline grunts about the, the wasteful spending. You know, they would send 12 Humvees to some local Afghan partner. Only two of them would ever get there. The other 10 would, would break down and disappear. And no one would even know where all the money went. It was like an unbelievable orgy of, of wastefulness. And... Um, you know, one other important detail on this, there, there's a, a, a guy who I think should be much more famous to all of us. Uh, his name is John F. Sopko. He's the Special Inspector uh, General for Afghanistan and Reconstruction, uh, that short for cigar. He was appointed by Congress about 13 years ago to look into what was really happening in Afghanistan and to report on, quote, quote, unquote, lessons learned from the Afghan war. And so for 13 years, Sopko has been very quietly, diligently interviewing people, front, everyone from frontline troops to commanders about what's really been happening in Afghanistan. And he's been releasing these reports that everyone in DC knows about, but nobody in the country knows about. Let me just read you. These are just the chapter titles from his latest report. Okay. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> just the chapter titles, harmful spending patterns, resistance to honesty, personnel struggles, willful disregard for critical information, Incorrect theories of change, poor understanding of local context. And by, by the way, that includes ignoring things like the sexual abuse of young boys by Afghan warlords who are our allies, okay, which the New York Times reported on. We completely have swept that under the rug, okay? That's just a table of contents, okay? From one of his latest reports, which is about 100 pages. So complete and incompetence on our, in our government, complete waste. The Pentagon was telling us the whole time. I mean, while this guy, Sopko, the, cigar, you know, the, the special inspector general, was telling us the truth of what was happening, you've got the Pentagon telling us and the elected leaders the whole time that we're winning this war, that things are improving, they had all these uh, bogus metrics to prove it. And, you know, and so it's, just, it's a systemic failure. But Sachs, what would be their motivation to say it's not working? Look, I, I think I think that well, right. What would be the motivation? Well, you, You're right. you can't you can't fix what you don't measure, and so basically, like if you want to lie, there there you have it. We have that now for twenty years of lying. But let's talk about the metrics because this is actually an important point. But this is my point: is like what what's what what's the objective for them to be measured? What's the objective in that case? No, the the objective is to demonstrate. No, the objective is to demonstrate leadership. The objective is to basically say, you know what, this is really not working, and this is about putting yourself in the position of a person whose child is over there, okay? If any of our children were there who signed up because they thought they wanted to do the right thing and, and, and you know, be in the Army or the Navy or the Marines, found themselves in Afghanistan, got killed, God, heaven forbid, and then that body comes back and there's this report comes with it, which is effectively what it is. Okay, this is the coda to the death of two point, you know, 2400 Americans and $2 trillion. I would be so heartbroken. I am heartbroken just thinking about this. Like this is not that's not what we're about. So we can't keep doing this. And we can't keep lying. We can't rationalize lying anymore. Right. Well, I, I agree with that. And let me just speak to the point about the metrics, because the problem was not that we didn't have any metrics. The problem is that the metrics are bogus. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, the mission was very unclear. It's not clear how you measure the success of transforming a country to Afghanistan, uh, like Afghanistan to our values. I mean, what, what really are the metrics for that? So what the military started doing is not measuring outputs, but measuring inputs. So you have, you know, the commanders on the ground saying, well, today we trained a thousand new Afghan troops. Okay. But what they don't say is that over 90% of those troops are illiterate and 85% of them are on drugs. I mean, and this is what the journalists who are on the ground when they would do the interviews with these, you know, with these, uh, you know, frontline uh, commanders or trainers, they would find this out. Now, why wasn't this in the report? Well, because the military is a culture that's based on advancement. It's basically a, the Pentagon is a big country club. It's a big insiders club. There's a dogma 
The dogma was we're winning the war. And if you want to advance in that organization, you're not going to be the one. You're not going to be the skunk at the garden party who tells the generals that they're full of shit. You're basically going to be the guy who gives them the metrics they want to hear. And then their boss, the, 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 the person who's the boss, the frontline guy, is going to improve things 20%. He's going to shade things another 20%. And then the next guy in the chain of command shades things 20%. And by the time you get all the way to the top, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is telling Biden, we have a, an army that's 300,000 strong. These guys are going to take over the country. We're not going to have a problem. We're going to have plenty of time to get our people out. And that is why we had a lackadaisical withdrawal strategy. These guys thought they had all the time in the world because systemically they've been bullshitting themselves about having a 300,000 man Afghan army. And then, you know, when you actually look under the hood of this thing, there is no army. It's just a, basically a bunch of kleptocracy. I think what happened at the end of this thing is even more dangerous for the future on top of everything you said, David, which I agree with is that what we basically said is that we will engage in whatever cover up is necessary, because we're not willing to lead and talk about the mistakes we've made and to do the things that are necessary to really fix it. And that's what's really fucking sad. Because as he said, as you said, tax, the minute that you knew that uh, bin Laden wasn't there, we had a choice, then the minute you knew that he was already dead, we had a choice and the choice was to do the fucking right thing. And instead, what happened was we got caught up in virtue signaling, we got caught up in personal advancement, we got caught up in the grift, we got caught up in graft, we got caught up in corruption, we got caught up in the, you know, military industrial complex. And here's, here's where we are. And the crazy thing is Biden had a moment where he could have stepped in and said, you know what, guys, I'm looking at all of this data. Here's the new plan. And he didn't do it either. Let me ask you a question. If Biden had run an orderly exit, and then it spiraled into Taliban and, and reverted mm -hmm. back to what it was, how would you feel about all this? Sex? I think I think I, that would have been were... that's the goal, right? Trump wanted to get out. Yes. And Biden both wanted to get out. So if yes. we just executed twice as good or 50% better, there'd be no problem here. We all want to be out, correct? Yes, that that decision, the decision to get out was a 70% popular decision when Biden made the decision in April. And then they and when Trump this made withdrawal. it last time because he that's did right. the ceasefire. This, this, this is a bipartisan, bipartisan decision yeah. to get out. Let's not pretend otherwise. It was clearly the correct decision to get out. But here's where Biden screwed it up. Okay. And there's some blame that needs to be apportioned to Biden and to, and to the to the generals. And we don't really know who screwed it up, but collectively they did. The big mistake, the original sin of this withdrawal is that they pulled out of Bagram airfield at the beginning of July. Okay. They didn't just pull out. They literally ghosted uh, the Afghan. I mean, they pulled out in the middle of the night without telling anybody. The Afghans uh, army who are our, our allies woke up the next morning and the Americans were just gone and the electricity had been turned off. I mean, this was unbelievable. And so the problem is we then lost our air superiority over the country. We lost our ability to conduct uh, close combat air support. We lost our ability to do a mass evacuation. Okay. We basically gave up our central military asset in the country before we got the civilians out, before we got our allies out. And there were 18,000 of these so-called civs, the special immigration visas. These are the Afghani uh, translators and helpers who were embedded in our combat un units. We, the, the, the State Department, meanwhile, was totally caught up in bureaucracy, slow walking their applications. Those 18,000 translators are now stuck there. Okay, they have 50,000 dependents. We're talking about spouses Brutal. and children. And that, so they have no way of getting out. And then the final thing that just takes the cake is that we gave a list to the Taliban of here's our biggest helpers. When they, if they go to the checkpoints, we want you to let them through. Oh my Lord. So it was basically, basically an assassination list. This is your given death a kill list. list. Kill They've list. given a kill oh. list to the, kill the, list. the yeah. Taliban. Yeah. I mean, this is really unforgivable. And it's, and it's, and this was, it's not like this was unknown. Okay. There was a bipartisan working group of both Democrats and Republicans who wrote a letter to Blinken at the State Department back in May saying, we they are afraid just, of the, yeah. about the safety of our Afghan allies. You need to get them out. Now the State Department is taking too long processing the special immigration visas. You're totally caught up in red tape bureaucracies. Solve this problem. Blinken did nothing. He was another deer caught in the headlights. They could have also just uh, instead of making people fill out all these forms and all this red tape, I heard one commenter saying like the right thing to do in situations like this is to just get everybody out, put them in a holding uh, location, and then process them there. In other words, if this person says they're translating their family, and they have, you know, relatively good paperwork, get them out, put them into that holding pattern, and then figure out how to process them later. 
we got to wrap on this discussion, get to some other topics. But the interesting thing to watch here is what's going to be the future of Afghanistan. And I don't know if you guys uh, saw the Financial Times story, but China is watching this uh, like a hawk. And they China have and Russia are just sitting there laughing. Well, China is even worse. They have aspirations of partnership in this region with Pakistan already and Afghanistan and building super highways and expanding their train network and having their own Silk Road essentially to, to get to the Middle East from China. And this is going to be the uh, axis of uh, they look the United States authoritarianism by Biden asked Putin if, if it was okay for us to stage military resources from you know, from 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 close quarters in Asia, and uh, Putin was like, "No go." Jason, I think what you what you just pointed out is the motivating factor for um, having a presence in this and other similar similarly situated territories around the world. Yeah, that a lot of people assume it's about imperialism and imposing kind of American democratic principles and ideals. I think that's the way the narrative is sold internally here at this country. But the truth from the intelligence community, and I think the folks that maybe are a little bit more thoughtful and long term thinking about this sort of stuff, is that the absence of an American presence in certain parts of the world will enable um, the uh, the success of what we would consider competing states globally. Um, and you know, there is still that unanswered question, ultimately, of how do we compete on a global stage, um, given what is currently. Um, a very negative view on our having a presence overseas, a military presence overseas, a physical presence overseas um, in these sorts of territories. And it begs the question of does that really set us up for challenges and failures in the 21st century as a nation state um, as the other global players, in particular China, you know, take advantage of these openings? Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with that. And let me just let me just say why China is so smart and we are so dumb. China is going to Afghanistan right now and cutting deals with the Taliban to build a highway so they can get to the rare earth minerals, which uh, Afghanistan is rich in. And they're going to use the, the super highway they're going to build to get that out and feed their economy. That is how they're going to spend their capital in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, we spent over $2 trillion and we have nothing to show for it. You know, they go abroad in search of rare earth minerals. We go there to lecture people on toxic masculinity. It is absurd. Okay. <laughs> now, the, the president... <laughs> well, you know what, Sachs? It's a little too cynical. We were also no, it's protecting... Not. No, it's not. We were educating David, women in that pronouns, country and don't protecting forget the them pronouns yes, from we being Don't forget the pronouns. Right. That's they right. them. They them. It's very important. We, that's right. We go there to lecture people on their pronouns. The, no, the, the, that, that the is too, far too cynical, Sachs. No, it's not. We went there to protect some people who wanted democracy and to allow women to read and to be f oh, we, members we just, of society. We just, I'm sorry, we just flushed that. We just flushed that right down the toilet. Sorry. I know that. We, but we, I mean, we let's just, not conflate that we just want to lecture no, them. But David, David is right. We knew that the minute we pulled out, we were casting 50% of that population to a complete state of stasis that was completely not known. So like, what, are you saying, under, Sachs, that we should have stayed there with some presence? Well, this is this is like the argument in Vietnam. No, that tell we, that, the truth. We should have just told the truth. We're leaving. We don't have a plan. And this is going to risk all women. It's going to risk people that helped us. And we are not sure what's going to happen. But you know what? We decided we're leaving. That was the truth. Remember, remember the Vietnam War? We killed two million Vietnamese to make the country safe for democracy. You know what the Vietnamese said at the end of that? We'd rather have our two million people back. We see these wars in terms of ideology. We think we're going there to spread democracy. They see it in terms of nationalism. All they see is a foreign invader trying to impose their values. That's why they don't buy into what we're doing. And by the way, the whole idea that we're going to plant Madisonian democracy in the soil of the Middle East, that was a 20-year folly that cost us trillions. And one of the reasons why there are no Madisons over there, there are no Madisons, there are no Jeffersons, there are no Washingtons. Who is going to take up that cause? What we had in Afghanistan is this President Ghani, who's a crook, who is off on the first helicopter with millions of our dollars. That is how stupid we are. It's the last place we should be trying to do democracy. There's other places where it's teetering and we can probably be more helpful. The American President John Quincy Adams, this is back when America had a rational foreign policy, he said, America does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. That used to be our foreign policy. Now we involve ourselves all over the world to impose our values for no reasons. It is costing us a fortune and it has led to the crumbling of the American, of, of, of the American wealth and power. And it completely erodes 
our trust in institutions, particularly the institution of the federal government. And we're left just scratching our heads saying, if not these guys, then who is going to figure so what this are, out? So what do we Who's do with Taiwan? Lead us out? If, if uh, Chamath and uh, Sachs, if you're don't no, want to be, if you Jason, don't want to support democracy in the world, what happens to Taiwan in your world? This signed Taiwan's death warrant. I'm sorry, but you should just assume that So we that should Taiwan just let Taiwan go. No, my point is the following. Taiwan will, when the when PRC has the right window, be under complete Chinese control. And we, because of how we have executed this and how we've executed the rest of our Middle Asia strategy, means that we will not really engage. And the reason is because it will be an enormous food fight inside the United States, where all of these past experiences of us fucking this up will come up. Should we defend Taiwan? Free Except by the way, the difference is we're not going to, we would not be going to war with a bunch of like fucking tribal people in the mountains carrying sticks and AK 47s from the 80s. This is China. So if we, can't, if, we, if we can't beat and win in Afghanistan, well, I mean, we also, what, what are our chances? I mean, I'm sorry, guys, but our this chances is like, alone, it's not worth it with a group of Japan, South over. Korea, Australia, and it's the over. EU, we should be defending Taiwan in my mind. What do you think, Freeberg? Should we try and defend Taiwan when this inevitably leads to the Chinese government finding their window as Chamath is predicting? Again, I don't think that the motivating factor could necessarily be imposing democratic principles as the priority if you were to 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 actually weigh that decision you would realize that you should probably have a presence in some latin american countries you should probably have a presence in central africa where there are authoritarian regimes that are doing terrible things but we don't have a competing global interest there to defend against well, to be clear, it, Taiwan is right now democratic, so we would be defending a democracy. Freeburg, Jake Al is asking a specific question. If China invades Taiwan, do you think the United States should get involved? On a principles basis, or do I think the United States will get involved? <laughs> Either <laughs> like, one. Yeah, I mean, I think the challenge is the escalation with China, right? So that's going to be the big calculus. It's really about what's the what's the long term cost. Certainly, on a on a principled basis, you'd say let's go defend the weak and go protect them because they they share principles and ideals with us. But the 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 backlash, the challenge would be if we were to do this, global trade would stall. There would be um, massive um, issues at home with people saying that we're getting involved in an overseas war. All of the reasons that, from a political perspective, it would stall our economy, it would cause all these. You know, I, I'm kind of um, speculating a bit here. But the actual cost isn't just about sending a few thousand troops over and surrounding the island and protecting people. It's actually much more severe than that. And if you were to weigh it, it could be that we end up with 25, 30 million people losing their jobs over the next decade because of the economic fallout that occurs um, in our doing that and so on and so forth. And a lot of American prosperity that we get to enjoy, um, you know, kind of, kind of declines. And so that's the real calculus. And I don't know how to do that calculus, but I think that is the calculus that, that is being done by the intelligence community to figure out the answer to that question. Let's swing it to Sachs to do yeah. a little bit more of this calculus because what we're talking about here is not giving up an authoritarian state right. that wants to be authoritarian. Right. We're talking about a democracy on the risk board yes. that would be taken and flipped from a democracy in, like Hong Kong has been flipped. I think it's a I think it's a very important distinction that Taiwan is already a democracy. They got there on their own. They've done a lot of hard work building that country since uh, that basically the the country became separate from mainland China. I think in 1945, it's never been under the control of the CCP. It's uh, they, it's a, a free enterprise system. It's democratic capitalism. There are, there's basically 24 million free souls who live on that island, and if we show any weakness. And we frankly already have by what we've done in the Middle East. If we show any weakness, they will fall under the boot of the communist regime. So I think it's, there's a big difference between trying to plant democracy or nation build uh, versus in a country that's never had it before in thousands of years and basically being friends and allies with a country that already is a democracy and just wants to be free. And I think our message to China should just be, we like things the way they are. We don't want them to change. That's it. We have a policy of what's called strategic ambiguity to Taiwan. It basically says that we may come to the defense of Taiwan or we may not. And I think we should just 
continue with that policy. I think our message should just be, we like the status quo. We don't think it should change. Let's leave things alone. I think that that's fine. But I think we need to be investing hundreds of billions, the trillions of dollars we wasted in Afghanistan could have been better served building an infrastructure in America for chips and semiconductors and a bunch of these critical components, because then it would give us a lot more bargaining room to uh, actually be able to play out that strategic ambiguity more fully. I think the reality is that despite the policy framework, the practical economic reality is that we would be engulfed in a war if if Taiwan were taken over by China. Because as Friedberg said, our economy would ground to a halt, because those critical assets are linchpins for how massive swaths of the American economy work. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you one thing we should be making plans for. I don't know if our military is competent enough. But We've talked on this pod before about how, what, 70% of the advanced chips come out of Taiwan, com- uh, companies like uh, TSMC. If China takes over that island, I mean, those chips are the new oil, right? We're going to be dependent on them in a way we never should be for our supply chain. You're right, Jamath, we never should have gotten this dependent. But frankly, our military needs to have a plan to sabotage those chip factories because we can't let them fall under the control of the CCP. Um, I don't know if they're competent enough to do that, but but if Taiwan falls, it needs to be a poison chalice for the CCP. We're going to need to make some decisions here because Russia with Crimea and the Ukraine and their ambitions, and then China taking over Hong Kong and looking at Taiwan. I mean, it, I think the lesson here is if you're a dictator and you are allowed to take over other regions and other you know, countries, you're not going to stop it is the nature of dictators. And we have to at least put our foot down, you know, Afghanistan's a shit show. But these other places, we're flat footed you know, right now, JKL, we're stumbling I know, forward. That's why, we're this not, is a serious problem. And so, and so we need to we need to sort of like recenter ourselves and get momentum, you know, you to use a poker analogy, yes. we basically just bluffed off half our stack with the jack eight offsuit. <laughs> and then when and then when you get the ace king suited, you have no chips to play with. Yeah, right. You know, and we you're have just to like, what was I doing? Our credibility. Ba- basically, 9-11, 9-11 put us on tilt, okay? And, tilt. We've been, and we've been losing pots for the last 20 years. Yeah. Now we just lost the big one. And the question is, to Tomas' point, are we going to lose the rest of our stack? Or are we going to go take a walk around the block like Muth re-center does? Recenter ourselves. And recenter. Exactly. Time to recenter. Time to take Time a little to walk. Okay. On the recentering thing, China is going in the opposite direction in a way that could actually help us. Meaning like, you know, it's uh, it's a pretty scary set of things that's happening over there. But it's also a kind of instructive about how we could recenter ourselves because there's, they're actually enacting the laws that we all talk about, we've been talking about for seven months, but they're actually willing to do it. And they, and so if American policy makers would actually should we pivot just, to what's going on over there with the China or should we go to robotics? Uh, let's let's finish China. And then we can and then and then we can talk about China is continuing their uh, crackdown of tech companies, uh, and has proposed a ban on foreign IPOs. Uh, The Wall Street Journal had some exclusive reporting today. I'll just read a quote and then hand it over to Chamath. China plans to propose new rules that would ban companies with large amounts of sensitive consumer data from going public in the US people familiar with the matter said. And in addition to that, uh, under these new rules, they are looking at the algorithms that are being run uh, and different services and making them transparent. And the Chinese government will basically control the algorithms that have caused so much chaos here in the United States with Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. And then finally, they're going to close the loophole on VIEs. Chamathi, want to explain what this means from a market perspective? Today's a really big day um, because of these things, Jason, as you just said. So let me just break this down because I think it's interesting for us to all learn about this together. So one thing is around the technology, which I'll talk about in a second, which you just pr- uh, uh, talked about and then uh, previewed. And then the the second is around the capital markets and the money flow. And that and this is a really big deal. So what is a VIE? Because you're going to hear this a lot. A VIE is what's called a variable interest entity. And what it is, is just a massive workaround. So essentially, what happened was, uh, a VIE was a legal business where, you know, an entity had control of a company, okay, through a contract, but not through equity. So it's kind of like, you know, Sachs, like I had a contract with Colin that said, I can dictate, you know, who does what, etc. But I don't own any equity. Now, the the company that completely ran afoul of all of these things was Enron. And back in 2001, Enron went fucking ham. 
as we all know, they had a bunch of these VIEs, and they used it to basically shield a bunch of losses and do a bunch of shady things. So then there was a bunch of accounting laws that were introduced. China, on a completely separate track around that same time was like, hey, listen, we want to control our economy. So we're going to prohibit foreign ownership. So just to, uh, for all you guys to know, China to this day does not allow a foreigner to own a piece, a large sections of the Chinese economy. Okay, so as of 2018, which is the last updated list, as far as I could find it, there are 33 sectors of the economy where China says you cannot be a foreigner and own any equity. You have okay? to have a local partner. No, you cannot own any equity. Yeah, exactly. Well, if you want to start partner. a business there, you have to have like a yeah. partner like Yahoo did. Yeah. So all technology companies fall under this, all data companies, any education company, any media company. So you can imagine it's basically every part of the economy that matters. And so with because of all these restrictions, you know, the Chinese internet companies were like, hey, hold on a second, I need to get access to the capital markets. What do I do? They dusted off the VIE structure. And they basically created all of these um, you know, Cayman's holding companies. And that's where all the American investors would go and buy equity from or contribute equity to. And so, you know, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu, DD.com, JD, all of these folks have these VIEs. And what's interesting about these VIEs is it's written clear as day, but not a single investor seemed to care. But in the prospectuses of these Chinese companies, they were clear. It doesn't mean you actually have a claim on the assets. It doesn't mean you can actually make a demand of management. I mean, if you saw this in an American prospectus, you would not put a single dollar into these companies. But in fact, the exact opposite happened because people were greedy and chasing the money. And, and these risks, by the way, came back to bear because Jason, I think you were the one that gave the example of the Chinese tutoring guys, where, you know, overnight, this guy lost 99% of his net worth, I think this was a one or two pods ago. The way they did that was that they canceled the VIEs. They said online tutoring, nope, sorry, these things can't exist anymore. And so essentially, we have the situation now where uh, VIEs are part of 58 companies uh massive chinese mega cap companies that are in the huge indexes in in the united states these 58 companies account for two trillion dollars of market cap we are we are we are now in a situation now where the chinese government basically says for online tutoring we're going to cancel the vies in a bunch of other areas we're going to start with regulation we could cancel the vies later and so we've essentially put the capital markets in my opinion on pause and so now let's transition capital to this other markets part. in china Capital markets in China, I think now are the most volatile they've ever been. Essentially, the People's Republic of China, the government, the CCP chooses how and who will make money. And they are basically putting their foot down in a big way in the capital. What markets. happens to the 1.62 trillion in existing shares that have been bought by people around the world? Would there be some way to unravel that or a tender offer? You're going to have to delist these ADRs. I don't exactly know what would happen. I think what it's happens unprecedented, is this, am I correct? No, you, you have capital loss, Jason, because when they canceled the online tutoring VIEs, the stock prices basically went to zero. So you could eviscerate $2 trillion of market cap tomorrow if they decide, you know what, that VIE for Alibaba, by the way, Nick, I'll send it to you, but it's a, it's a thing of art. If you look at the VIE structure for Baba, I mean, it is a fucking babushka doll of nesting entities <laughs> and this or that. I don't know how any investor who bought shares in Alibaba actually took the time to understand what they were actually buying. They suspended disbelief because they were greedy. So, so the point is that's happening. Okay. So the, the capital markets are now, I think, getting uh, really constrained. The complement to this is that they're starting to now introduce legislation as a prelude, in my opinion, to canceling some of these VIEs in the most important area that we care about, which is tech. So Jason, to your point, the Chinese cyberspace watchdog today or yesterday, I think it was, they just published a list of draft regulations that will now become law. I'm just going to read this to you. So uh, let me just, just FYI for you guys. So let me just give you a sense of them. Users must be provided with a convenient way to see and delete all the keywords that an algorithm uses to profile them. Number two, providers like shall not have that. Providers shall not record illegal and undesirable keywords in the user points of interest or as user tags and push information content to them, and they may not become discriminatory or biased based on that information. 
Um, users must be informed that algorithms are being used on them to recommend content or products to them, and they must be allowed to opt out and see completely generic non-personalized results. The algorithm recommendation shall adhere to main, this is incredible, to mainstream values. I don't know what that means. They must uh, means actively harmony in China. They must actively spread positive energy and promote the application of algorithms for the better. Providers shall regularly review and evaluate and verify these algorithms, models, and datas with these watchdogs. These watchdogs will now start to increasingly take board seats on the comp on, on Chinese companies. So you put these two yeah. things together, it is a takeover. big moment in China tech. It's a takeover. Yes, yes. I mean, so, so some of those provisions sound like, you know, privacy regulations we might want to adopt over here. Completely. But I think we should focus on the one towards the end that you mentioned. The algorithm recommendation service providers shall adhere to mainstream values, hmm. actively spread positive energy and promote applications wow. for the better. Now, how do you actively spread positive energy? I mean, as a business person under that regulation, like, what does that even mean? I mean, it basically means it means what you're not spreading, David. It means you're not spreading a protest in Hong Kong. It means you're not talking about the Uyghurs. It means you're not talking about Tiananmen Square. You're not creating social unrest. This is a way for them to say, you know, positive energy means don't criticize Xi Jinping or the CCP or bring up topics that are in the no fly zone like the Uyghurs. Well, they're 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 going to have content moderation guidelines. Yeah, yeah, they're bringing it all under their control. That's what it's about. I mean, these this is the type of thing that, despite all of our problems, makes me very happy to be an American. <laughs> yeah. Can you? Well, imagine? I, I would I would say though that yeah. the first part of what I said about their regulations to me seem really intelligent, and I think Americans would want that. And if American policymakers would actually just suspend disbelief for a second, go to the Chinese website, read Nick, we can put a link into the into the show notes of where the regulations were published, and actually try to implement those laws. I think we as Americans, we'd all want most of them except that one. Yeah, well, that's what the devil does. They mix the lies with the truth in order to get you to be convinced to give up your freedoms. Friedberg, what are your thoughts? I'm getting increasingly convinced that this idea of like decentralized blockchain based government governing might work in the 21st century. <laughs> I just feel like they're, the, you know, we keep hearing more about the overreach and the ineptitude of uh, centralized institutions like uh, CCP and the US government. And, you know, I'm not hearing anyone that says, man, you know, this is a great, well, I, we're seeing I, great I actually, progress. No, but Freeberg, I think, I think the CCP is actually pretty good. I, I, what they do, we may not agree with them, but I think they're pretty good. I agree competent. with you. I agree with you generally. Yeah. But I do think it, it creates an incentive and a motivation also because if you don't agree with their, their, their principles, you know, you're going to find yourself looking for an alternative. So, you know, I don't know, we should, this is probably not the right time or forum for this conversation. We should probably do it on another show. But we should talk about um, some of the innovations, uh, blockchain innovations that, that, that are taking place. And Jake, I know you spent a lot of time on this as well. But, you know, it'd be worth kind of talking about the notion that, you know, can you see um, governing move to the blockchain? Um, and what does society look like in maybe the 22nd century if this becomes a reality? And how do we, how, how does the world kind of evolve there? Well, in the crypto world, you would put in some effort, you would have some skin in the game, and you would, because of your processing power, your nodes on the network would get some votes. So it'd be like in a democracy, how much money you had, or how much work you produced, you had some sort of say, which kind of sounds like ours. I mean, imagine if the US government instead of, you know, having some folks go to Congress and say, I want a trillion dollars and spend 25 years in Afghanistan. You know, it was more of a distributed decision making process where data was available in real time metrics were used to make the decision and um, the folks that actually contributed dollars uh, to the network ended up being the ones that made the decisions based on how many dollars they've contributed or based on some other principle of, of decision making um, that doesn't kind of aggregate institutional ineptitude, uh, which is kind of part of the issue we've seen here. Well, so I think that brings up an interesting point, which is, you know, when we talk about all the ways that we could have spent these trillions of dollars better than nation building, here's, here's the fundamental problem. I mean, I agree with that. I mean, I wish we had spent the six trillion that we spent on nation building in the Middle East. I wish we had spent that at home domestically on our own priorities. But here's the problem is I think what Afghanistan and specifically the military industrial complex shows is how good these special interests get at extracting money from the system while providing so little value. 
You know, we spent so the, we, the, these contractors spent or we, we, they, they charge so much to basically deliver so little on Afghanistan. Do you really think it's going to be much different for the trillion dollar, the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill that's coming? You know, and if we created- They're licking um, their lips. They're licking yeah, their lips. Yeah, exactly. The, 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 the people, the, the groups who are going to get that money, who are going to feast on that trillion dollars are people who their skill set is lobbying, okay? That is what they spend their time doing. And Sorry, if you I are, think it's backwards. If, no, listen, and if you are really good at lobbying, why would you even waste your time trying to get good at delivering value? You're not. That's your business's lobbying. Well, that it's, is your value. Yeah, that is your skill your set. Exactly. So this idea that we can basically spend a trillion dollars on some domestic innovation program, the problem is it'll never go to the right people. It'll never go to the innovators. Mm. The best thing we could do is just not spend the money, quite frankly. So smaller government. Or how about, how about just not a government that's uh, $20 trillion in debt? I don't know how it's like smaller or small government to, if we were to save $6 trillion, we'd still be $14 trillion in debt. It's not a small government. I think the good jumping off point here might be the Supreme Court eviction moratorium uh, and the Supreme Court not upholding it. And what are your thoughts on that, Sax? Because it does relate to this never ending free money train, no repercussions of personal behavior and, you know, spending insanely forever, it seems like we're never going to stop with the stimmies. Yeah, I think the Supreme Court threw out uh, Biden's eviction moratorium as unconstitutional. Look, I think it's great. You know, the the government should not be uh, preventing eviction, you know, especially not the federal government. I don't understand how this is supposed to work. I mean, all you do, look, look, I don't want to see anybody get evicted, but the reality is you have to pay your rent. And if, and if there are groups of people who can't pay their rent and the government decides that, uh, that those people should be helped, the right way to help them is to give them the money to pay their rent, not just to tell landlords, sorry, like you can't collect yes, rent Congress anymore. Congress could give more stimulus yes, to those it's people. A, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a taking, it's, it's a clear taking from landlords to say that, oh, your tenants don't have to pay you anymore. How does that make sense? Well, how do we unwind the free money train? Because there's 10 million job openings right now that are not getting filled. And then we have unemployment starting to unwind or the bonus unemployment starting to unwind. And then we have all this uh, free rent concept or just you don't have to pay your rent. At, at some point, it, it feels like we have to let the free market come back and maybe people can't pay their rent. So they go take one of the 10 million jobs. I know that sounds cold hearted. Uh, no, but J- at Jason, some point, talk- there has to be some landing. Before- you've talked about this before in California. We have a labor shortage in California. Because we've basically run a controlled experiment in the uh, UBI, the Universal Basic Income, where we've basically been paying people not to work or paying them regardless of whether they work. Guess what? They don't take jobs. And so we actually have a labor shortage in California, despite having high unemployment. At some point, the government's going to have to say to people like, look, COVID is not an excuse for shirking your adult responsibilities. You know, we all have a responsibility to go to work, to pay our rent, you know, to pay our parking tickets. And COVID has been this excuse for suspending, you know, this, this sort of normal life. And the problem is COVID is going to be around forever. It's like the cold or the flu. It can't continue to be this excuse for people not working, not paying rent, not doing what they're supposed to be doing. I think on top of that, though, I think, Jason, maybe you want to talk about this. I think on top of that, we uh, are amplifying that by taking people's agency away. And we are... Prop 22. Yeah. And Prop 22 is a perfect example of that, which you should talk about. But when you put these two things together, on the one hand, you have a government that basically wants to subsidize uh, opting out of the system. And then you have a set of laws that if they're not unwound, reinforce that dynamic. And you put these two things together and folks just want to sit on the sidelines. Yeah. Let's get Freeberg. Well, Freeberg, you want to talk about the Prop 22 um, Supreme Court decision, et cetera? Yeah, there was an appeals court. Appeals court. Um, yeah, an appeals court that uh, overturned some elements of the uh, California Prop 22, which was a heavily lobbied California proposition, lobbied by Uber and Lyft and other um, businesses that have built effectively marketplaces for independent contractors like drivers and delivery people and so on. The SEIU, which is a big employees union, had, um, you know, fought very hard to pass legislation in California that made it 
um, effectively very difficult for people to operate as independent contractors and forcing companies like Uber and Lyft to treat them like full-time employees or to treat them like employees. And so Prop 22 was to counter the union-funded legislation um, which uh, basically provided more freedom and flexibility to workers where there weren't all these very arbitrary random rules that if you're a writer, you can be an independent contractor, but if you're a driver, you cannot. And, you know, all, all this nonsense that, that took place because the unions were trying to increase the scale and scope of, of their union base. Um, and so Prop 22 was passed in California after much spending and lobbying, and it passed by a pretty decent margin. And then this court ruling basically in, in the appeals court overruled the constitutionality of some elements of Prop 22, which brings into question whether that Prop 22 is actually going to hold in California. Therefore, are all these people who are drivers for Uber, delivery people for DoorDash, um, and all these companies that are creating like Thumbtack and, you know, all these companies that are creating marketplaces for individuals to have flexible work, to go and work where they want, when they want, to find gigs, to find, you know, short-term jobs, to find... Um, you know, tasks and projects that they can run, uh, are they now going to be seeing that those marketplaces stop working? Because when you have to start treating those people like employees, the flexibility and freedom that those marketplaces enable stalls out and, and kind of, you know, as we're already seeing. So it's, it's super nasty. And the implications are that we're now seeing, um, uh, you know, we're, we're now facing once again, this crisis of, you know, our, our basically lower income people, um, people that want to have flexible labor are going to be restricted from having access to to gig jobs um, because the unions want to force everyone into a full time job, which you know, as our friend Bill Gurley pointed out, is kind of like an archaic element of yeah, the nineteenth and twentieth century. I mean, this is like Let, a let's play old school um, a way clip of work. from uh, Bill Gurley and. and here it is. There's one big issue that I don't think is talked about enough, which is, you know, that if you poll the drivers, they're not looking for any changes. They're really happy with the flexible work product. If you look at the voters of California, they stepped up and voted and made it very clear in a, in a state that voted two to one, you know, in favor of Biden, they came down very strong 60 40 that they didn't want this to happen. And there's one uh, entity that's really been pushing this the whole time going all the way back to 85. And that's the SEIU. It is a single union. But to call them a single union understates it because they are the granddaddy of special interest groups. I, I sent along some data maybe you can put on the screen. Um, they spend more money lobbying than any other organization in our country and have for many, many years. Um, they only represent 2 million members. But the, oddly, those members are in hospitality, health care and government services. They're not even in this industry. So they're taking the dues from their members and using it to fight these battles because they want to expand their footprint. What they're really after is putting $400, $420, which is the minimum member union fee for the $2 million they have. They want to expand that to these drivers. So they don't yeah. actually want to help them. They want to add to their cost. Um, but they're the, they're, the, they're the one that's been pushing this the whole time. And I, I think it's worth just saying one thing thing on this, which is, um, you know, this is uh, really kind of um, a question not about California and Prop 22, but it's a question about what is work and all the tech companies that are enabling a new form of work globally. People don't want to have 40 hour a week jobs. People don't want to have to go sit at a desk all the time. People want to have flexibility in their lives. They want to have gigs. Technology enables us to quickly find short term jobs, short term opportunities to work on things and make some money and figure out how we want to build our lives in a more flexible way, figure out how workers want to build lives in a more flexible way across all industries. And um, it's really, uh, frankly, um, you know, a, a, a non progressive policy to say that everyone has to be pigeonholed into working, you know, full time 40 hour a week labor jobs, be employees and not have the flexibility of running their own business in their own way with the uh, with their own time and choosing what they want to go do and work on. Um, and so this sort of legislation, and this sort of battle is a really important one for defining the future of work in the United States, which will ultimately represent the future of work globally. And the craziness of all of this, David, is that Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, DoorDash drivers, etc., are getting paid a fortune now because there's a labor shortage. And these ride sharing companies have given a minimum uh, $21 an hour fee. So I, I don't know exactly what's going on here. But it seems to me like it's a union grab because everybody else who's affluent or rich real estate folks, uh, you know, doctors, whoever, 
can be freelance, but if you're a rideshare driver or a freelance writer, you don't get to be. And uh, it seems just incredibly unfair. It is. And, you know, one of the best things about COVID, I think, for all of us is that we learned that we could do our jobs from anywhere. We didn't have to go into an office. We didn't have to work the standard, whatever, nine to six hours. We could be anywhere. We had flexibility. And I mean, I think it's one of the lasting consequences of COVID that's actually been very positive for a lot of people. And here you have the government basically trying to take away and prohibit freelance work, flexible hours, uh, gig type jobs. These are the sort of modern, flexible working relationships that people want. Why are they getting rid of it? Because of lobbying pressure from the SEIU, which only has 2 million members. It's not even a big union, but they got Lorena Gonzalez in their back pocket. She passed AB5 in California. The people of California didn't want it. Remember, 58% of Californians said, we don't want this. So they overturned it in this ballot initiative. And now you got this activist judge basically, you know, um, inventing these specious grounds for overturning Prop 22, which is what the people want. So it's ridiculous. And, you know, the common thread to me on this show that I've come to realize about American politics is just the degree of special interest corruption. And, you know, people are used to thinking in terms of left versus right. It's not. There's a special interest corruption that pervades everything. You've got this union that is destroying freelance work and flexible working relationships because of corruption, because it benefits them. You got defense contractors in Afghanistan who are just looting, looting the Pentagon and the federal budget because it's in their interest. You've got these special interests of both the right and the left. This is the central problem in American politics. And, you know, what they do to cover up the naked self-interest is they disguise it in a kind of woke virtue signaling. So they'll start, you know, talking about, you know, how what they're doing is for the benefit of these drivers when the drivers don't even want it. And to build on that, I'd say, you know, my great realization from having this conversation with y'all every week is that we are starting to propose a nanny state in which people have no agency, even if they want to have agency over their life and career, you are taking it away. And then if there's no repercussions to people's behavior, and they have no agency, they become, you know, uh, disenfranchised from society. And why are they going to participate? And then what kind of society do we have, if people can't make their own choices? And you see it also in, you know, uh, accreditation laws, and you see it where only rich people can invest. And now you're seeing it with this freelancing, where, you know, uh, my dad would have loved to have an extra shift or two to make extra money. And he, he's not allowed to? 80% of drivers want flexibility. They're willing to participate on things that ultimately, um, on things that they think matter, but don't necessarily solve the core root cause problems. There are people right now in America, I think, are focused too much on symptoms, meaning, you know, uh, they want to fight for the right hashtags. They want to fight for the right pronouns. They want to make sure that you know, this person gets canceled for things that happened eight or 10 years ago. And I think what they don't understand is these are all symptoms. And this is this is not what solves the problem. Right? We have a water crisis in America. We have a food impending food crisis as we shut off the water. We have a climate crisis that's engulfing the entire nation. We're still in the middle of a pandemic that we can't control. We have an economic system that's fragile, that's dependent on uh, a country who's sometimes our friend and sometimes our foe in China. These are huge transformational issues that we can't get organized around. And so instead, we spend our time at the edges on the symptoms. And we think the symptoms are if we get the pronouns right, everything's going to come together and everything's going to get fixed. The looting will stop. The graft will stop. The corruption will stop. And it turns out actually it emboldens those people to say, hey, wait a minute, I'm tricking these people. Everything that I wanted to happen can happen. Let them focus on the pronouns while I continue to loot the American treasury for another trillion dollars. That's where we are. Yeah. And the perfect the perfect representation of that is Gavin Newsom. He represents both of these trends. He is one of the most corrupt governors we've ever had. There were As soon as COVID happened, they suspended uh, all sorts of, um, you know, the, the, the process for contracting so that his uh, campaign contributors could get all these special contracts. He cut a sweetheart deal to PG&E to absolve them of liability for all the fires they've been causing. And on and on it goes, the, the, the $12 billion to the homeless industrial complex. And then he disguises it with all this woke virtue signaling. 
And so, you know, I would just give a shout out to the recall campaign. The election is on September 14th, but the ballots have gone out. If you want to send a message to the political class that this special interest corruption has got to stop, let's cut the head off the snake here. Just vote to recall Gavin Newsom on question one. Period. All right. You guys want to end on uh, Jeff Bezos. Um, let's, let's, let's talk about the AI bot first and then, and then Bezos. All right. So um, if you haven't been watching, Boston Dynamics uh, tweeted a video, which we'll play right now as I talk over it. And um, it's basically their robots, which have been picking up heavy objects and walking around doing parkour. If you don't know what parkour is, it's basically people jumping off the side of objects and flipping and doing balance beams and vaulting themselves all around. It is basically it's robots. It's like break dancing in France. <laughs> yeah, but from heights and jumping over things yeah. as well and no, breaking the French, are, the French are like parkour experts. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think uh, parkour is French for jumping. Uh, I made that up. But if, if, and if, and you, look these, if you look have at you these- Have you seen Sachs do parkour? Uh, no, uh, absolutely. Uh, I have never seen him. We'll, do we'll, we'll show parkour. that video. I have time. seen him so drunk that he's on the floor, but <laughs> never <laughs> seen him do parkour. <laughs> but don't get in the way this robot of sacks looks and a bottle like, of DRC. <laughs> this, this robot looks more dexterous than any of the Terminators we saw in the films. And then adding to that, oh, and if you didn't know, Boston Dynamics got bought by Google. I'm sure Freeberg has some inside information on that. And then they uh, got sold again. SoftBank had bought them, and now they uh, are owned by uh, Hyundai, the Hyundai, South Korean yeah. Hyundai, the South Korean automaker. Because apparently, the softies at Google didn't want to be involved in uh, government contracting with robots, i.e., making soldiers of the future. Well, which obviously, I don't know. The Chinese I have. I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize the whole story like that. I mean, remember, like there, there well, what was. It? Well, Google bought Boston Dynamics in 2013. And remember, Boston Dynamics had been around for over a decade prior to that. They spun out of MIT like in the 90s, I think. Um, and they were had always been working on, you know, advanced neural nets being applied to kind of, you know, automation systems so you could get things to mimic real life. Um, and the idea at Google, this was when they had set up Google X and were starting to kind of do a lot of this, um, you know, moonshot type tech, tech investing as a separate entity outside of the core Google. And it was like leveraging their cash flow to start new projects. The idea was let's, you know, build this into kind of a next gen robotics platform. They had Andy Rubin, who previously started and ran Android. Um, company was called Danger. Google bought it, turned into Android. Um, run, the, or, run the unit and they made several other acquisitions. They rolled them all up into this kind of robotics platform. They had spent... I think 400 million on Boston Dynamics and hundreds of millions more on these other companies. Um, and ultimately, I think the challenge was less about like, you know, who does or doesn't want to do contracts with us. But it was more about the fundamental question that is still the question mark today, uh, which is, do we really need general purpose automation? Or do we need special purpose automation um, for industries for customers, right? Where do you find product market fit? Do people really need a robot that does parkour? Or do they need an automation system that can lift boxes and pack and place things or an automation system that can move things from point A to point B? And so if you're solving for a customer's problem, you typically find that the special purpose automation solution is a more elegant, cheaper solution that you can get to market right away, like building an automated little truck that moves things around or building a machine that lifts and puts this boxes in the right place. Parallel Versus the discussion the, like, between narrow AI and general correct. AI. Correct. And this is exactly the same question, Jake Al is like, you know, is, um, you know, is general uh, purpose AI really what the market needs? Or are there specific applications of neural network or machine learning technologies that allow us to solve for the problems that customers have without needing to replicate the human being. So when you're lifting boxes, you don't necessarily need all the other things that humans have, right? You don't need to, to mimic a human. When you're moving a package, you don't necessarily need to have four legs to do it. You can have it on four wheels and just have a, a simple system that moves it around. And so, you know, I think SoftBank, you know, Masa Sun had this whole belief with Vision Fund One when he raised the hundred some odd billion dollars that, you know, the singularity where machines were going to be smarter and better than humans in every way, intelligence and dexterity and all these things were about, was about to kind of, we're about to pass that moment. And this was part of that core thesis he had, which is this is going to be the robotics company. Uh, and I think as we've seen, they can mimic parkour, but they can't do all the other things humans can do. And if you're, you know, trying to get a machine to do something that a customer needs, it's really not 
parkour. Let's be honest, they can't even walk a dog because they wouldn't they know how to deal with the edge cases uh, if the dog had diarrhea. And so I think, there's core chases IP, I, I think there's core IP at Boston Dynamics that's certainly critically valuable for businesses that are in special purpose automation, which Hyundai is. There's going to be a great set of applications for leveraging that IP into some of the existing product lines and, and customers that they serve. So in related, serve. in a related story, Elon then uh, revealed the Tesla bot plans at his AI day. He's in a couple of his AI days. And I think they're primarily designed um, to get AI talent, which is some of the hardest developers to find in the world. Um, and they said that their Tesla bot will weigh 125 pounds, 5'8". So I'll be a half inch taller than it. Um, but it will weigh significantly less than me and it will move up up to five miles per hour and can carry 45 pounds. Uh, Elon said the reason he was doing that is so a human can easily overtake it in case it becomes sentient, which was quite entertaining. Uh, Chamath, you think this is, what are the chances Elon has a robot like this and um, it's operating in the real world? I saw a bunch of journalists dunking on him that this would never ever happen which is kind of hard to believe when there's a million Teslas on the road. Yeah, no comment. And I think uh, it's awesome. <laughs> oh, okay. Can't comment. All right. Leave it at that. Uh, Sachs, you have any comments on this? Um, I, it was, you worked uh, with Elon at PayPal. Yeah, I, I thought it was a little bit of a surprise that he was working on uh, a robot. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously this has been an interest of his. He's talked a lot about it. And so it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, it's just another innovative thing he's doing. Should we talk about Elon versus Bezos on the space well, thing? Yeah, well, we'll, we'll jump in a minute. I just wanted to let people know, by the way, the robot going at five miles an hour, it's not as outlandish as I think some of the journalists and idiots out there who don't build anything in the world who were kind of dunking on him, like we're saying, if you think about those cars going 65, 75, 85 miles an hour on the road, processing the world, doing a neural network, machine learning on the fly to figure out where the car should go, a robot going five miles an hour is an easier task. I think all those people dunking on him should have just taken a step back and actually asked the question, am I just being really insecure right now? And if so, why am I making fun of this guy who just seems to be, you know, firing on all cylinders? And maybe it's maybe it's me. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm writing this article out of my own insecurity. Maybe I'm feeling a little impotent. You know? yeah, and also to, to dunk on, on a guy for the version one or even the version 0.1 of a product is so ridiculous. I mean, I remember so the, the version zero of Tesla. Now look at the company. I mean, you know, it's about iterating. That's how you get to products. So it's just so stupid in short term. And by the way, to dunk his, on the current product capabilities. And his, his, his style of doing these things, I think, makes a ton of sense. When, when, you know, he started with Starlink, it was the same reaction. People were dunking, 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 too slow, too expensive, not going to work. And what you find through these events are really technical people building companies that could help him want to be a part of the mission. Right. And so, you know, for whatever it's worth, it's like, I think Starlink's going to be a real thing. I think this is probably going to be a real thing. I think great companies will get absorbed into this, these efforts. I think, uh, I think it's great. And I really think the people that are just so low, like, th there's like this loathing going on. I just don't understand. Shamath, what do you think will differentiate the um, opportunity for success? with Larry Page owning and running um, Boston Dynamics, then Masa owning and running Boston Dynamics, and then Elon trying to take on the same project from scratch. You know, why were these other two kind of well-capitalized, influential businesses that have a track rate partners not been able to turn Boston Dynamics into kind of a successful business, but, but you guys believe Elon will? If I had to just categorize them, I would say... Uh, Larry is absent and is sitting on a hundred billion dollar fortune with no idea what to do. Um, I think <laughs> on one of seven is islands. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's just absent. So yeah. he's irrelevant. Um, I don't think anybody knows what the fuck he looks like. Um, I mean, we do. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's frittered away enormous potential, I think. Um, I think Masa is a master capital allocator, but not an engineer. And I think Elon is the most important technical product and business mind of our lifetime. I think the answer is even simpler. He's the customer of the robot. So he understands what the spec should be because he has so many robots working in the factories. So he's going to buy the first thousand to go colonize Mars or work at a space station to build shit in space. And he's going to have them working in the Tesla factory and for the boring company carrying rocks out of tunnels. He's the customer. Of course, he knows. And Masa wasn't the customer. Masa was looking to 
increase uh, whatever money he bet on. Think it has to do with, but it's also it's also skill set. Like Masa, of course, is an yeah. incredible visionary and investor, but he's not going to be the guy Correct. in the engine room making the robot. Larry, it, now to, in fairness to Larry Page, he could be that good, and yes. there was a moment in time where Larry was that good, and frankly, better than e Elon. Uh, but that window has closed and it's well passed. And now, you know, it's kind of like the player that just keeps getting better and better. I think that's Elon Musk. Go ahead, Sachs, your thoughts? I mean, nothing to add to that. I think you both made great points. I mean, the amazing thing is that Elon is still working so hard, doubling down, coming up with new ideas, new initiatives. I mean, it's working harder than ever. When yeah. most people are, you know, doing, most people would do what Larry did, you know, go buy an island. Or seven. And, or, and hang out, you know? Yeah. All right, Bezos is lost his way, um, and he left his position as CEO of Amazon to focus on Blue Origin, and then he um, sued NASA over the moon program, accusing NASA of wrongly evaluating its lunar lander proposal, giving all the funds to SpaceX. He then did a series of like infographics talking about how terrible SpaceX's plans were. Um, this lawsuit has delayed SpaceX's work on the project, according to The Verge. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, Amazon urged the FCC to uh, dismiss the newly submitted plans for SpaceX to launch another cluster of satellites uh, to power Starlink. And uh, Elon tweeted, turns out Bezos retired in order to pursue a full-time job filing lawsuits against SpaceX, uh, which is uh, hilarious. Um, what? what how sad is this that it's a huge miscalculation in the following way, which is that in order to, for Jeff to achieve his ambitions, he needs deeply technical people. And this is the simplest way to basically turn them off because this is not what technical people do. What do technical people do? We don't we don't take our toys and run from the sandbox crying like a bitch. We stay Got there it. and we keep iterating trying to make things work. Yeah, we don't act like patent trolls. I have a new I have a new slogan for you, J. Cal. Go ahead. Winners do and losers sue. Winners do and losers sue. Okay, folks, there you have it. It's the all-in <laughs> podcast. We're back. We're back Young from Spielberg a big vacation. Makes, Young, Spielberg, Young Spielberg, make, make it banger. happen. Yeah, make the banger. <laughs> make a banger. All right, everybody. Freeberg, what's your Freeberg? Do you have any thoughts on these uh, on the lawsuits? I feel bad for Bezos. I feel like he's just getting so beat up on this shit. It's um, it's honestly, it's it's a little disappointing because I think he's got all the right intentions. He's an incredible engineer, obviously an incredible operator. I'd love to see him and Elon succeed in the work they're trying to do, as well as all the other startups that are pursuing this. I am concerned about, frankly, the lack of commercial readiness for this industry. I feel like in terms of the hype cycle, we're at that early point where the, the, the investment dollars and the number of companies exceeds the market demand. Uh, and therefore, there's this um, fight over the one or two customers, which is basically NASA and the federal government. And it's creating this really nasty set of circumstances because that's where the money comes from. That's where the customers are right now. And so they're, they're all fighting over one or two customers. And, you know, Elon filed suits um, against, uh, you know, federal agencies when he lost contracts. And yeah, that's, no, no, he did that when they no bid them. I get it. I get it. And slightly you know, different. Still, I get it. But still, like, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, Bezos uh, is willing to put his money where his mouth is. He's offered to put up a billion dollars or more to fund this. I'd love to see multiple uh, companies simultaneously going to the moon, multiple companies simultaneously going to Mars. But um, rather than have, you know, single contracts with, with one customer um, or have, you know, private industry figure out ways to make money from this and, and fund it. Uh, the, the challenge is just it's another product market fit question, right? The market is one customer today. Um, and, yeah, but uh, and Bezos so is almost over. 60 years old. He's got 150, 200 billion dollars. It's going to cost him two or three billion dollars, one, two, three percent of his net worth to do all this. Just fucking do it, Bezos, and stop crying and you're right. Filing he, may, lawsuits. He, he may end up doing that. Yeah, that, but that the problem is he's, about but it he's, and just he's be losing a, be the, a competitor. No, but he's losing the human capital that's required. So there was a huge, there was a huge, uh, a great little press off. cycle about uh, this one great person who was like the the leader of the of the lander project who just quit and went to spacex my point is other engineers don't want to see that this is the way to win compete yeah, he's, gotta crawl. he's got he's got to crawl out of that hole now yeah build iterate and solve build iterate solve it certainly seems the case that his um pr stunt with uh, shooting himself into space didn't do him any favors either it, you know it's almost like everyone sees the great work elon does when he does these pr events and he gets all this attention and publicity and gets positive press and accolades. 
And then Bezos does them and he's like, oh, Bezos you know, has no besties. There's no bestie <laughs> taking Bezos aside. He's bestie list he Bezos. Be- no, no, no. I, I, <laughs> by the way, Bezos. He may, no, he may have besties, but they're not They're not doing no. the job that other if besties do if for other not, people. If they're yes men and women and they're not being true besties, they need to tell him when he's got something that's a blind best- spot. He needs real besties. And the blind besties. spot here is he was dunking on Richard Branson and being like, oh, you didn't go to the right height. Here's an infographic. Stop with the fucking infographics, Bezos. So what are you 12 years old and you're like going to the teacher with like a drawing like i i should technically get an a plus and i should be singing the solo for the choir <laughs> practice and like some other person is like got the solo you get the if, fucking solo next year bezos if bezos offered you a huge um consulting fee jake how would you be his uh, bestie um consigliere i'm a bestie for hire for sure yeah. for sure yeah. i'm bestie as a service <laughs> by the way i hired I, I hired this fuck nut he flies back with me i mean he literally ate everything on the plane and then in what are you the talking worst, about and then you, hold on I, let me finish you were eating let, the tiramisu let me finish you went let you me finish. On the he said to me, I he said to me, Chamath, you have some great toiletries in the back. Mm. I said, I did. Yeah, sure. You know, there's Marvis, there's great toothbrushes. And then out of his pocket, he pulls some scope bottles that he had over. <laughs> <laughs> I have more in my bag. I don't have to buy scope until I, 2022. I, I was and it's shocked. It's not generic, it's the real scope. This motherfucker was looting. I looted the Looting. Plane. I, nice I, looted, I, I looted all your lactate. We, we all take advantage of CP. Oh my God. This, this other guy, <laughs> this motherfucker, Freebird, once was so buried, he got so fucking mad, he grabbed all the lactate in my, you know, little, our little medicine cabinet, and like ran mince, out, then came he back. Mince. He was angry and he was like, I'm so fucking angry because he had lost a big pot right during poker then he took all the pistachios and shoved them in his pocket <laughs> it's like it's like an afghan warlord he's just, <laughs> he's just stealing everything the street bird stole the pistachios <laughs> yeah I stole the pistachios and the lactate and the lactate, and the lactate. Yeah. And the lactate. He went, he's like yeah. fuck it I lost 10 dimes I'm gonna be- get back $37 in lactate oh my god <laughs> so sad so sad oh alright I'll see you all wait, wait Freebird do you want me to prepare the house do you want me to prepare the the, the yeah. room I think, so. I think so yeah I think so I think so that'd be awesome if you could do that Oh my god! I'm I'm gonna, I'll, bring some, uh, I'll bring some tests, some Binax tests too. Yeah, yes, I, I mean, just as an aside, I, Bill Gurley was talking about this. We talked about this early in the pandemic. Why don't we have fucking one dollar tests, Friedberg? Oh my Why god! Why does everybody insane, not right? have a hundred tests the, the, everywhere? The Binax now tests are literally lateral flow strips. They cost pennies to make. It's how much did it cost the, to buy? Twenty bucks. Why is it so, not a dollar? Why yeah, couldn't dollar. Biden or Trump get that done? Is it some grift? Yeah. Graft? Greed? Yeah, you should yeah, get Michael Mina on to talk about this. He's uh, the uh, the guy to talk about it. But um, I mean, if people were taking those every day, we could. I, I think you guys may remember this. I tweeted about this over a year ago. It's like last April, where we could actually print these antigen tests for pennies in the U.S. I mean, when we had that like whole emergency authority thing, and we were making masks and liquid oxygen tanks and all this shit, we should have been printing antigen tests on strips of paper. We have the facilities in the U.S. to do it, and we could have made you know. 100 billion 50 cent tests um, and made them just uh, free and available to schools, to workplaces, to everything. It's, it's absolutely insane. That yeah, we but people can't, the- people can't be freelance riders or drive an Uber for two hours a day in California. Yeah, exactly. We can, we can mandate that, but we can't mandate a 25 cent, 50 cent test and put them in everybody's fucking mailboxes. I'm on fire now. It's fucking stupid. Everything is so dumb. Everybody's a grifter in this government. Incompetent assholes. Hmm. I, would, I, I would like to i would like to vote Newsom. i would like to go to uh war with uh fiji because it's beautiful um <laughs> <laughs> occupy fiji. I, i'd like an island and i think that fiji yeah. probably has a lot of them well fiji um, is not respected than pronouns, french polynesia so we should go just because i think it's a little yeah. clo- closer yeah. um yeah we so could go there and spread pronouns yeah. um also, I'd like to go to war with Iceland, but only in the summertime because I hear it's beautiful. There. I'm going <laughs> like to war with, May, I'm going to war with Tuscany uh, uh, over uh, the gelato. I'm going to war with Florence over gelato. Don't fuck, I'm going to occupy with, Tuscany with country. for nope. the pizza and the pasta. No, I'm no. occupying Tuscany. <laughs> You'll need to build a bagram in all these places just to accommodate all the private jets that are going to come <laughs> bagram, in. Bagram, bagram. <laughs> I mean, ha- but just to, in closing, <laughs> let's just let's just say thank you to the amazing uh, people of Italy for having oh, what an the greatest country. 
country for adults to go on vacation in. What an incredible country. Florence is amazing. Tuscany is outrageous. Rome the is beaches, beautiful. Venice is incredible. Everything the is delightful. I love you. Sardinia. I love you, Italy. I love oh, you so much. And I'll I be love back you so much next too. year. All right, we'll see you Ti all amo next tantissimo. time. Ti voglio bene, Italia. Oh, just love you too. I'll see you next time on the All In Podcast. Bye. Bye. We'll let your winners ride. Rain Man David Sachs. We open source it to the fans and they've just gone crazy with it. Love you, West Ice Queen of Kinwa. Besties are all going through the death. That is my uh, dog taking a notice in your driveway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's my habit to actually meet me at Blitz. We should all just get a room and just have one big, huge orgy because they're all just useless. <laughs> it's like this like sexual tension that they just need to release somehow. We need to get merch. Besties are I'm back. Going all in. I'm going all in. David Sachs, you come to me from your boat in Sicily on my daughter's wedding day. Sachs, you come to me. And you ask me not to interrupt you so that Henry Bellacaster can make a clean cut of your speech. Well, you can start by acting like a man, David Sachs. No, I got interrupted on the podcast. Oh, you didn't let me finish my thought. You wanted this part? You wanted this part on this podcast? Who's the director? Who's the producer? I'll get you this part. But someday, Sachs. I'm going to ask you for a favor, Sax. I'm going to ask you for an allocation in All In. In your call-in app. I'm going to ask you to lead the Series B. And on that day, I expect the valuation because measure it with what I've done for you today. Okay, David Sax. <laughs> That's a pretty good bit. Look at uh, Don Canoli over here. Don Canoli. <laughs>